Well, good evening. I'm John Hardman, the President and CEO of the Carter Center, and welcome you to the first of this season's conversations at the Carter Center. This series gives us a chance to discuss the Carter Center peace and health work around the world with all of you. And I would encourage you to get more information about the series at our website, cartercenter.org slash conversations. You can also subscribe uh, to this uh, through our podcast on uh, iTunes, if you know how to use iTunes. <laughs> A very special welcome to our Rosalind Carter Mental Health Journalism Fellows, the Fellowship Board, and the task force who worked uh, with Mrs. Carter on mental health issues. We also welcome our ambassadors and Legacy Circle members tonight. So for the next hour and a half, you will hear President and Mrs. Carter discuss the work of the center, describe their recent travels on behalf of the center, and answer your questions. So I remind you to fill out a question or fill out one of the cards you picked up as you came in, and volunteers will be walking through the audience collecting those cards throughout uh, tonight. But we will begin tonight's program with a short video on the work of the center. There are six billion faces on Earth, some full of hope and dreams, others empty with despair, constrained by barriers that keep them from healthy and productive lives. The Carter Center works to tear down those barriers and create a world where everyone has a chance to live in peace and enjoy basic human rights. We look on human rights as a broad umbrella under which we not only have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, freedom of religion and that sort of thing, but also the right of people to have a decent home in which to live, to have food to eat, to have a personal freedom to choose their own leaders, and also to be free uh, from unnecessary disease and hunger. Well, I think the main thing the Carter Center does is bring hope to people. It doesn't matter where we go. The Carter Center has worked in over 70 countries to advance peace and fight devastating diseases. The center's staff of over 150 people work in many of the poorest regions of the world. After leaving the White House, the Carters had a strong desire to continue to make a difference in the world. And in partnership with Emory University in 1982, they founded the Carter Center. The Carter Center was created as a place where people could resolve conflicts, like at Camp David. Over the years, the center has helped improve relations among nations and has opened the doors to peace. But it quickly grew to understand that peace is more than the absence of war. It is the building of strong democracies founded on human rights and justice for all. These are the seeds of permanent peace. Well, I think the main thing we've done is to promote the concept of freedom and democracy in countries that had never known what an election was. And this has been a transforming experience for many people. The center has observed over 76 elections in 30 countries, including Indonesia, Ethiopia, and Palestine. As a result, leaders are held accountable to the people in countries that have never had free and fair elections. The Carter Center is a leader in fighting neglected diseases. Diseases like guinea worm, river blindness, trachoma, and lymphatic filariasis. These are gone from the developed world, but they still afflict some of the poorest people on Earth. 
The uh, promising thing is that these diseases are all preventable because we've proven that in the rich world. If the folks are just given a chance to know what they can do to improve their own lives, then they can transform their own lives into an opportunity for hope and self-respect and anticipation of a better future. The eradication of guinea worm has been one of the major challenges of the Carter Center because this is such a horrible disease and is in such remote villages that no one else ever wanted to tackle it. And we're just on the verge of complete eradication of this disease from the face of the earth. And this will be the second disease in history ever completely eradicated. The transformation of a village population after one year of effort on their part, guided by us, is one of the most gratifying experiences of my life. The people of the Carter Center work for peace, fight disease, and most importantly, bring hope to those who never had it before. We are willing to take a chance that we might fail if we believe that the ultimate goal is worthwhile, worth our effort and worth an investment in people who have been neglected by others. We were the poorest, most isolated people in the world. And I think often if we weren't there, there would be nobody to help them. These people who have been suffering in the past, when we work among them or with them, we find that they're just as intelligent, just as ambitious, just as hardworking, and their family values are just as good as mine. The Carter Center works where the need is greatest to improve the lives of the poor, the disadvantaged, and those who have no voice. The center's accomplishments are a fitting tribute to its founders. There are literally hundreds of millions of people whose lives have been changed by what the Carter Center has done, plus many others who have benefited from the proof that we have provided to other agencies that they could do the same thing. Building hope is what we do at the Carter Center. President and Mrs. Carter founded the not-for-profit Carter Center 29 years ago, and since then, the center's programs have helped to improve the lives of millions of people in more than 70 countries. The Carters are our hardest working volunteers, traveling around the world, working with our staff to monitor elections, resolve conflicts, promote human rights, and eradicate diseases, working side by side with the poorest and often forgotten people. Their vision for a world at peace guides all of our work here at the Carter Center and serves as an inspiration for millions of people around the world seeking a better way of life. So it's with great admiration that we welcome President and Mrs. Carter. Thank you very much. Well, I hope I've already gotten some sympathy, have I? <laughs> well, I've had a very interesting summer. Uh, in June, I had my left, my right knee completely replaced, and then last month I had my other knee replaced, and I've been through a period of uh, intense physical therapy and recuperation. I'm doing well now. I got a couple more weeks that I'll have to use a cane just for safety purposes, but uh, I'm doing okay, and I, I'll soon be over. And I've been uh, grateful that, uh, sometimes grateful that I did it. Uh, there have been times when I was kind of doubtful in retrospect. It's not an intense pain, but it's a constant uh, discomfort. 
particularly when you're trying to sleep and do things like that. But uh, it'll soon be over, and I'll be grateful for it. The Emory doctors did a, did a superb job uh, on me. Uh, this brings me down now to our subject of tonight, which is a much more pleasant one. Uh, Rose and I generally outlined very briefly what we've been doing since you had your last meeting, and so I'll do that uh, to begin with. As a matter of fact, uh, the Carter Center has to raise cash money almost $100 million every three days to finance our program. And that's our budget. And uh, no, that's not, that's not, it's a million dollars million every three yes. days, $100 million a year. A <laughs> million dollars every three days, about $100 million a year. And that's just our cash budget. And in addition to that, we get enormous uh, contributions from uh, pharmaceutical companies and others uh, that helps us with our health programs. Out of that total budget each year, uh, roughly $100 million in cash, about 80% of it is in the health program. And this is something that we didn't anticipate at the beginning. I didn't know, and Rosen didn't know when we left the White House, what we would do when we finally decided to establish the Carter Center. We thought we might be devoting most of our time just to conflict resolution, mediating disputes around the world. But as we have explored the greatest needs on Earth, and particularly those who were not being met by others, we have found this to be the number one issue, and that is health care. As the film so beautifully showed, the elimination of the suffering of people from diseases that ought not to exist at all. Because all the, even sometimes medium wealthy countries, have eradicated, done away with all of these diseases. Perhaps the only one that we would still remember, some of us, would be malaria. And we haven't had it in a long time, since the 1940s. But it still exists. So hundreds of millions of people every year suffer from these diseases that should be eradicated or eliminated. And that's what we do most of the time. Uh, as was mentioned in the film, our most highly uh, publicized effort has been to eradicate the disease of guinea worm, which is caused, as you well know if you come to the Carter Center more than once, the drinking of impure water that has the eggs in it and it goes to a long worm about 30 inches long. It takes about 30 days to emerge from the body and it's excruciatingly painful. It causes this loss of muscle tissue like the aftermath of polio. And the people who have it, if they are school age, can't go to school and farmers can't go to the field. So it's a devastating economic and social blow as well as suffering intensely. We started out with about 3.5 million cases of guinea worm in 20 countries in Asia and in Africa. I think 26,000 villages. We've now been in all the villages. And we've cut that 3.6 million down. This year, we expect to have not more than about 1,000 cases in the whole world. Last year, Ghana became free after 23 years. Uh, they started out with 126,600 cases. Now they have zero cases. This year, Mali and Ethiopia will have maybe one or two cases or very few. And it's very hope we're hopeful that neither one of those countries will have any guinea worm after this year. But it still exists in the southern part of Sudan, where for many years, a horrific Civil war prevented our getting in there, and as you know, Sudan has now become an independent nation. And uh, they still have some areas in southern Sudan of intense uh, conflict. And that makes it almost impossible for our workers to go in there safely. Our trucks and our motor scooters and so forth get confiscated. And so we have, uh, that is, is a major remaining uh, problem. But we are very hopeful. We will continue to work on it. We work with the government there. We hope that we'll soon have, see the end of guinea worm altogether. Another very important uh, disease is onchocerciasis or river blindness. Uh, we have treated now, uh, uh, we have given a dose of medicine to 150 million people. Uh, last year, more than 13 million people were treated personally by Carter Center representatives. And when you give them one miraculous tablet of mechtizan given to us by Merkin Company, then they won't go blind. But the disease still exists with worms in their bodies. 
Uh, trachoma is another disease. It's the number one cause of preventable blindness. We're working on that as well, particularly in Ethiopia. And last year, there were uh, a number of uh, surgeries to eliminate that terrible disease. Uh, and the Carter Center was responsible for the performance of 30% of all the surgeries in the world in that disease. We also treated the diseases with uh, a medicine called Zithromax that's also given to us. And so we are making very good progress against trachoma. Ghana, by the way, has become trachoma free, and we're working on that as well. We deal also with lymphatic filariasis. You saw the man with a horrendous foot or leg. Uh, we call it elephantiasis in this part of the world. And that uh, is another disease on which the Carter Center is working, as well as, as, uh, uh, as, as, well as malaria, which I've already, already mentioned, and, uh, and, and schistosomiasis. What we've done recently in the last few years is combined our effort against those diseases, because quite often in a similar, in, a, in the same village or region, you have several of those diseases. And over a period of years, we've worked out a way to reduce the cost of treatment of those diseases by, to, by combining our efforts. You can send the same people in, train the same people for the same people that are suffering from different diseases. And the World Health Organization estimates that we've cut down the cost of that by about 40%. So we're making good progress in the field of, uh, of health care. Uh, for instance, we put up, uh, we put up uh, millions of uh, bed nets that prevent mosquitoes from getting to the people at night and also killing the mosquitoes when they land on the nets. It has a pesticide in it. And both the lymphatic polarizers and malaria are carried by, the, by, the, by similar mosquitoes. They all die from landing on those nets. So that's what, that covers our disease effort. The other part of it is, uh, I would say, democracy and freedom. One of the innovations that the Carter Center has made, beginning in Latin America, was helping troubled countries have an honest and fair and safe election. And we didn't realize at the beginning how terrible and all pervasive this problem was. Uh, countries, for instance, that have a totalitarian dictatorship and want to try democracy for the first time, they don't know where to turn. They don't know how to draft a constitution and laws and set up election commissions and register voters because they've never done this before. And so the Carter Center provides that service. In some cases, we have uh, countries that have had democracy for a number of years, and one party becomes so powerful that they don't permit any, ops, uh, you know, any uh, opposition forces to arise. And so democracy is threatened in those democratic countries. We go in and help them as well. We've now done over 80 elections. Uh, this year, we'll soon be going to Liberia. We've already conducted two elections in the past, monitored them. And we'll be going to Tunisia. You've been reading about the African Spring. Tunisia will be having an election uh, next month. As a matter of fact, Rosen and some others will be there. I can't go. I have a conflict. We are also looking at the Central African, uh, at the uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly Congo, and we are going to help with the election there as well. Some others that are in prospect for this fiscal year is uh, Nicaragua, for instance. We are doubtful about Nicaragua now because they won't give us freedom to monitor as we need to. And, and also uh, Egypt. We're still trying to contact Egypt to see if they will let the Carter Center or any other international observers uh, come in to monitor the election. We try to negotiate for peace. You saw some of the more controversial people with whom I've met, uh, Kim, uh, uh, Kim Il-sung from North Korea. I've been to North Korea twice in the last year. Uh, also, Cuba. Uh, we have a very counterproductive uh, foreign policy of trying to freeze out the Cuban people and depriving American citizens from a right to go to Cuba. We're the only nation in the world where the citizens can't go to Cuba. It's, a, it's an imposition, a deprivation of our human rights, so our government doesn't let us go to Cuba unless you have a special reason like education and so forth, or, or religion. So we're trying to, to work out uh, areas of uh, peace. We are also dealing quite uh, effectively, I think, uh, in other areas of the world on, on peace efforts. We have a strong program in China. Uh, Rose and I will be going back to China again in December. Perhaps the most interesting, and the last one I'll mention, is the Middle East. Uh, the Carter Center maintains a full-time office or presence in Jerusalem, in Ramallah, in the West Bank, and also in Gaza. And I think we're the only organization on earth that deals with all the major protagonists, the major players in the Mideast conflict. 
we deal with uh, Israel. Uh, we deal with uh, the Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, Fatah. We also deal with Hamas, who control Gaza, and also they're located in Syria. We go frequently, frequently to Syria, to Egypt, to Jordan, and other countries in that, in that neighborhood. I think we're the only ones that really try on a comprehensive way to bring about peace, and I'll be glad to answer questions about that in the future. So those are the, some of the things on which the Carter Center is working. You can see we have a very busy uh, schedule, and now I'm going to turn it over to the real boss of the Carter Center, who's waiting impatiently to speak, my wife, Rosa. Well, um, as John said, um, we have my um, fellow, we have a program that I think most of you know about because I've talked about it before, the ones of you who come, um, Fellowships for Mental Health Journalism, and our fellows are here. We kind of arrange this so the fellows can be here for, for this program, I think. It might have been by accident, uh, but I'm glad, it, I'm glad they come. Um, and, um, but it's been, well, we work on stigma, trying to overcome stigma all the time, and this is our most successful program. The media has such an influence on how people feel about mental health, people living with mental illnesses. And so our idea was to build a cadre of journalists who knew the issues and could report accurately um, on, on them and balanced uh, on the issues. And we're doing that. We've already had over 120 go through our program. Um, this is our 15th year. We have every year six from the United States, and we've gone international with our program too. Our first country was New Zealand. We have uh, two. We had two from New Zealand for five years. Uh, we help them with the, with financing the program and at the, uh, the the foreign countries. And at the end of five years, they own their own. And New Zealand established a really good program. Um, South Africa. We've um, and we have two here now from South Africa, and two from Romania. South Africa um, has, um, this is their fifth year, so we're having to say goodbye to our South African <laughs> friends, and we're really sorry about that. Um, but Romania has another year or so. And um, somebody in the mental health program figured out that our journalists have done over 1,400 pieces on mental health. Um, we have five or six books all kinds of documentaries, TV and radio programs, print media, newspapers, magazines, and now, now our journalists are using blogs to get the message out. And that's been really, we were listening to some of them today, and they were really wonderful because people write in, and one of the journalists had great photographs. She's working with military families, and, and um, it just, and military families need so much help, and, and so it's been good. And I would, I would even like for them to stand up. Could you stand up? And also our advisory board is here. Um, can you fellas stand up? <laughs> and the advisory board. <laughs> and I might even have some of the task force. John, John mentioned this to you, but he didn't mention to you that I have the best advisor. I have the best people in the country as advisors and as and on my mental health task force. I'm really proud of it. I'm proud of the fellowship program. Um, we have started for the first time in a foreign country uh, a mental health program in Liberia. We've been working, the Carter Center has been working in Liberia for a long time and after the um, war was over, we've been in, we have, we're teaching the Liberians to, um, we're, we're helping them set up a judicial system and, and we have an access to information to open up the government. Um, and now we have the mental health and maybe other programs. But um, now we have our mental health program in partnership with the government. All of this is in partnership with the government. And we just graduated our first class of psychiatric nurses, 21 um, nurses and physician assistants. And they're from six counties in Liberia. And our goal is um, to, to and we work, go back a little bit, we work in the countryside on the rule of law and, and our programs. And so when they graduate, they go back to the counties from which they came to, to study. And uh, we want to have 150. Liberia has one psychiatrist. And so there's great need. And, and we chose Liberia because we've been there so much, but also 
We wanted to try to see if we could do in a, anything in a country that's coming out of war because everybody is, tra everybody is traumatized. And so that's, that's a, we're excited about that program. Um, next month is our mental health annual symposium. Um, it's going to be on the mental health needs of vulnerable children, welfare, juvenile justice, the, the domestic violence, and that kind of thing. We're looking forward to that program. We have a really good um, speakers and people participating. And as Jimmy said, he told you about his knees, so we've been home. Um, and, and this is his first time out, actually. Uh, um, but last week, I went to see Michelle Obama. I have the Rosen Carter Institute for Caregiving, and she has this program for families of veterans. And I wrote her a letter and told her that the vet, so many veterans coming home with PTSD and uh, traumatic brain injuries and depression, and that um, I have a program for bringing communities together um, to talk about or to, to assess what's in the community for uh, those um, people with mental illness, as well for, for people, not only mental illness, but any kind of illness. And um, um, so I, I went uh, with Kathy Cade, who's worked with me on projects in the White House, and she's been working with me ever since. She's on the Mental Health Task Force and on the Rosen Carter Institute Board. And we had a really good meeting with her. She, I saw um, Michelle at Betty Ford's funeral, and she told me she had gotten the letter, and she said, we have a gap there, so I'm hoping that we can work with her on that. Um, and let's see, next week I'm going to the United Nations um, to talk to African First Ladies about immunization. I've worked on immunization as long as I've worked on mental health, except for a skip between when we left um, the White House and when a, 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 an epidemic started in late 1989. Um, but um, I worked with Betty Bumpus, who was the wife of former Senator Dale Bumpus. And um, when all during the, in fact, I worked with her in Georgia. She, she had a great program. And um, when you go to governor's conferences, the wives get together. They were all wives back then. Um, and all spouses were all wives. And, and I talked to them about mental health to try to get people to work on mental health. And she was working on immunization. And she helped me set up a, we had a really good immunization program in Georgia when Jim was governor. Um, and then in the White House, we had been there about two weeks when, when uh, Betty called and said, um, um, do you want to work on measles this time again? That meant all immunization. And I said, sure. She told me later that she just wanted to see the inside of the White House. <laughs> but she's teasing. She's a lot of fun to be with. Um, but, um, and then, and, um, and we... This is hard to believe. When Jimmy was president, I'm not talking too long. When Jimmy was president, <laughs> only f either 15 or 17 states required immunization by school age. And Betty says 15, I say 17. I asked Dr. Dr. Fagy one day, and he said, oh, 15 or 17. <laughs> but anyway, we were able to get it in all of the states. It was one, I think, one of our really good accomplishments. And then in 19, late 1989, there was an epidemic that started in the Chicago area with 100 people dying and so forth. And it was the little children, um, because the school-aged children, and elderly people too, but school-aged children uh, were safe because they had been immunized. And so with Dr. Fagus' help, who was the head of the Centers for Disease Control when Jim was president, was here with us. Uh, we still call him a fella. We started a program called Every Child by Two, trying to get babies immunized. And so that's, that's um, we're still working on that. Um, let's see. And then I go to Tunisia. Well, it's good to be back in circulation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's just one more thing. We've had a spate of um, articles that have something to do with our house. And it's, and, we got, I got this email Sunday that said, you spread all over the front page of the Observer. Observer is the Guardian newspaper in 
um, in Britain. It's the um, Sunday edition. And it's a really good article, but I want to tell you, this woman from Wales came, reporter from Wales came, and I want to tell you what she, I want to read you what she wrote about our house. Where does Jimmy Carter live? Well, close your eyes and imagine the kind of house an ex-president of the United States might live in. The sort of residence befitting the former leader of the most powerful nation on earth. Got it? Right. Now, scrub that clean from your mind and it's... <laughs> And instead, imagine the sort of house where a moderately successful junior accountant and his family might live. <laughs> and, then it says, and then it says, Plains, Georgia is barely a town. A street might be a more accurate description. A single road going nowhere much. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. But it was a really good article. Well, thank you very much, President and Mrs. Carter, and we are all set for some questions. We will take as many questions as we have time for tonight, and we very much appreciate the questions that were submitted online, and we were able to choose some of those as well as some of the questions that you have submitted. The first question. As an Arab American, I view and understand that the Internal divisions in Syria are such that a peaceful transition to democracy is very difficult. Would you consider mediating in this conflict? Well, I think it, right now it would be very difficult to uh, ascertain who could speak for the so-called revolutionaries or dissidents or demonstrators in Syria because my understanding is we keep uh, track of it pretty well that it's basically localized among the different communities, and they don't have much communication with each other. But I would say this, if, uh, if President Assad, who might survive, and the dissidents or demonstrators ask the Carter Center to come and mediate, uh, then I would be very glad to do so. Yes. Uh, for Mrs. Carter, could you give us an update on the status of insurance parity for mental health coverage? I am so upset about what has happened to Parity. Parity was passed in 2008, and there's still no final regulations. They issued um, temporary regulations in, I think, February of 2010, and, um, and they have not enforced those, and insurance companies are doing anything they want to do. For instance, the Florida Blue Cross Blue Shield has... Um, discontinued all of their behavioral health care insurance. They say they're going to start another company and provide mental health and behavioral health care um, insurance for, for those um, illnesses. Um, but I think what they're doing is the, the parity bill calls for employers who provide mental health care um, to that, well, they, it says they have to have it on par with physical health care. So I think what Blue Cross Blue Shield is trying to do is just start another company so they won't have to um, provide insurance on a par with, with um, health insurance and what they provide for health insurance. I talked to Phyllis Barzai, who's uh, in Kathy Greenlee's office at the HHS. She's the what per, per, person, point person. And she told me that um, she needed my help because um, she goes to the, she's the one that goes to the White House when they set priorities. And she said every time she goes, every month or so, I don't know how often they meet, she's there and she tells them that we need to get the final regulations. And um, um, they put it on the priority list. And when the priority list comes out, uh, it's not there. And I hear the rumor is, and I don't know whether this is right or not, but I think people believe that they want it, they're trying to wait and, and, and um, hook it some way to the health care bill. Well, if they do that when they get into all of that controversy, it's just going to be awful. So I'm really distressed about it. 
I might say this is one of the greatest achievements of the mental health organization That's in the right. country. And Rosen led it for many years to get um, mental health insurance on a parity with physical health. The p problem is that when the uh, bill passed, since then the White House has not done anything yeah. to implement the bill. And I think the uh, health and education, uh, labor, and all the others that are involved in it would be very receptive to a strong leadership from the White House. It just has to materialize. So basically nothing is being done in the meantime. As Rosen said, the insurance companies are going backward, trying to avoid the impact of the bill. It's a very worthy thing. It ought to be put into effect. Uh, the whole mental health community worked. I, I actually, in the President's Commission on Mental Health, that was one of my, um, one of the things that we recommended, insurance uh, for, for mental um, health issues and so mental illnesses. And so it's just really, really distressing to me. The Carter Center was instrumental in bringing a fair democratic process to Nepal. Since the rewriting of their constitution and inclusion of former rebel Maoist in the parliament, how do you view the state of democracy in Nepal at this point? Roger? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing about them. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, we did monitor the election there. It was a very fair and honest and open and safe election. And the Maoists won a plurality of the votes and therefore they had the chance to form the first government. But the outside forces, including the United States of America and, uh, and India, as well as uh, domestic uh, forces within Nepal, didn't like that idea. So they basically put the whole progress of writing a new constitution to replace the monarchy has bogged down. Uh, just in the last few days, though they have finally uh, decided on a new prime minister who is also a Maoist. He's not the original leader of the Maoist camp that was the first prime minister. So we have another chance to do that. Almost all the other monitors in Nepal have withdrawn, including the United Nations. And at this point, the Carter Center is about the only outside force that monitors every day what is going on in Nepal. Uh, uh, two years ago, I, I was there three times in one year to try to help put together this effort. And uh, my hope is that we'll see in the future some progress made. But at this moment, they've got a new start with a new prime minister. Uh, and we don't yet know if he'll be successful in continuing uh, the formation of a new constitution and a, and a permanent government. It's, it's, a, it's a worthy effort, one of which we're going to stick with as long as we can get funding for it. Uh, but at this point, dormant with some hope for the future that hasn't been there a couple of months ago. I'll tell them about the, meet, the meetings. This is something that's um, not good about our country. Um, when we go into a country, we work with National Democratic Institute, which is an organization that goes in to train local observers. And um, they go in for months before we get there. And they train people in all the communities across the country. And um, when, in this, when they were getting ready for this um, election that we did um, and had the meetings in the country, in the countryside, if a Maoist walked into one of those meetings training the, the local people, the, the, um, our people had to grab up all the refreshments, the drinks, the cookies, or anything, because the Maoists might eat one or taste one. Now, that is just uh, awful to me. I couldn't, uh, it was one of the worst things that I heard, but it was, it was right. They, we call them terrorists, and the terrorists can't partake of our refreshment. <laughs> All participate in an election, and, and the fact is that the Maoists, um, once they are characterized as terrorists, the United States can't deal with them. You may or may not know that until last June, June was a year ago, Nelson Mandela was a terrorist, <laughs> and he could not come through customs in the United States without a special permit. So whenever we don't like anybody, quite often our country says, those are terrorists, and therefore they're outside the purview of normal democratic associations and, and social events. So that's happened not only in those two countries, but in others as well. The state is scheduled to execute Troy Davis a week from tomorrow. You have spoken out in hopes the state shows clemency. What got you involved in this case, and why are you advocating for his life? 
Well, Rosen and, and I, the Court of Senate, ever since it was founded, have been opposed to the death penalty as, just as a, as a major commitment. And on individual cases, we have interceded by writing directly to the governors involved or to the pardon and parole board or whatever is, is involved. And, and we believe that in this particular case, there's enough evidence to the contrary to prevent this execution taking place. I've written a letter to the uh, pardon and parole board. As you know, the governor in, this, in Georgia doesn't have any authority over this. And we hope that they'll reverse themselves, or at least that there'll be some way of, uh, of legal action up to the Supreme Court to avoid this execution. Uh, Georgia has very few executions now. All the time I was governor and president, there were no executions in the United States of America. As you all may remember, the Supreme Court ruled against the death penalty. But uh, while I was president, they ruled that the death penalty was permissible in this country and, and it's been implemented since I left office. We're the only uh, industrialized country on earth that permits the death penalty. And uh, as you probably know, the United States now has more people in prison per capita than any other nation on earth. We have seven times as many people in prison per thousand as the European countries do. And uh, so we have been very deeply committed as a nation, as a people, in the last few years of incarcerating people, giving them uh, life sentences for a third conviction and so forth. As a matter of fact, Georgia uh, has uh, a life sentence now uh, after two convictions, you're in prison for life. So we've just gone overboard in putting people in prison and keeping them there. And uh, so that's a basic policy of the Carter Center, which we've maintained. Uh, it's a matter of legal uh, decision, and we don't yet know what the final decision will be. Do you still enjoy hiking, fishing, and hunting? What is your favorite big fish story? <laughs> Mrs. Carter, do you want to <laughs> Sure, I'll answer. I've got a big fish story. Uh, I was in Canada. Uh, what was the river? I don't remember the river, but um, I love I fly fish. I love to fly fish. And, and um, the Canadian ga ga government presented us with rods, rods and reels. And um, when we got there, and it had a kind of looked like cork or something that came here that if you caught a big fish, you could put it on your chest like that. So we were doing an American experience or something, a, a television program. We had TV cameras with us. And I caught a salmon, and um, we had the French television there, I remember, uh, because the man in the, the couldn't speak English. But um, he, um, I was reeling it in, and the reel fell off in the boat. <laughs> and it was going round and round like this. And I was holding the salmon was running, running and running. And, and all of a sudden, it, the salmon stopped. And we got this um, television, the man with the television camera in the boat to come over, and he got some of that gray tape. Duct tape. Duct tape. Duct tape and, <laughs> and put the real on, and he put it on backwards. <laughs> we had to take it off and put it back on, and the salmon just sat there. <laughs> and so I got it all fixed, and I caught my salmon. It weighed, what, 20, 25, weighed 25 pounds. <laughs> so President Carter's going to pass on that one. <laughs> does, does the success of the revolution in Egypt affect the long-term stability of the Camp David Accords? Well, there were two, people don't know this, so I'm going to give you a little history lesson. There were two agreements negotiated by me with Israel and Egypt in 1978 and six months later. The first one is, is actually the Camp David Accords. And the second one is a treaty between Israel and Egypt. They're two separate things. Most people refer now, even the news media do, to the Camp David Accords as both of them. As far as the Camp David Accords, this was dealing with the Palestinian rights, where Begin and Sadat, the leaders of the two countries, agreed that Israel would withdraw its military and political forces from Palestine, from the occupied territories. 
and would grant the Palestinians full autonomy, and that the United Nations resolutions, including 242, would apply. That was the Camp David Accords, dealing primarily with, with uh, Palestinian rights. Six months later, we negotiated a treaty between Israel and Egypt, and that has been honored. The Camp David Accords have never been honored by Israel. Unfortunately, I left office soon after that. And so the Israelis have never honored their commitments to the Palestinians. They have continued to build settlements. They continue to occupy the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And the Palestinians have no basic rights. The peace treaty, though, between Israel and Egypt was honored by Sadat. And Sadat was killed shortly after I left office. And President Mubarak in Egypt honored the peace treaty very meticulously, and so did Israel. So the peace treaty part has been honored and never violated. When, but Mubarak looked the other way on Palestinian rights. When Mubarak was overthrown and the new government was initiated, which still has yet got to go through elections, they honored the desire of the Egyptian people to put into effect the Camp David Accords with its commitment to the Palestinians. And that's what they're insisting on now. I think that the fact is that the demonstrations of the people against the Israeli embassy in Cairo, as you know, it was overrun last week and the, and the uh, Israeli ambassador had to go back to uh, Jerusalem, is a very uh, great tragedy. And the military group that are leading Egypt now did not defend the embassy adequately. My guess is that the military leadership in Egypt still want the, treat, the peace treaty with Israel to be honored, but they also want the right of the Palestinians to be recognized. So to answer your, your question specifically, I don't believe that the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt is in danger. It's a cool treaty now, but I don't think they'll go to war. As you may remember, with the peace, with the peace treaty, Egypt reoccupied their own Sinai region, and Israel withdrew from the Sinai. And Egypt agreed to a very limited number of weapons uh, in the, the Sinai. And they have both abided by that rule. The only exception is that after the Arab Spring and after some disturbances in Gaza, Israel approved a few more weapons that Egypt could bring into their own Sinai region. So the bottom line is it's a complicated affair. Uh, the Arab Spring has brought hope for democracy and freedom to many uh, people in the region, including those in Syria still, and now in Libya, and in, and in uh, Egypt, and, and in Tunisia. And, uh, and I hope that eventually this will bring about a change in the prospects for a peace agreement to be negotiated between Israel and its neighbors. Uh, but it, would, it would require, though, that Israel withdraw from the occupied territories, and that's something so far the Israeli government under Netanyahu have not been, able, not been willing to do. What do you see as a transition in Cuba if they allow free enterprise as a means to deal with the present economic reality? Well, we've been to Cuba several times, and the last time I, I met with uh, Fidel Castro's brother, Raul, for about seven hours. He runs a country. He runs a country now. As you know, Fidel is uh, retired, and he writes op-eds every couple of <laughs> weeks to the discomfort of his brother, but, but uh, uh, so I was with him seven hours. He, he talked for six hours and a half, <laughs> and I listened, and then he listened to me for about a half an hour. Th this was just two or three days before he had his major uh, assembly of, uh, of leaders throughout Cuba, and he announced the uh, implementation of a new economic freedom in Cuba. And so my hope is and my expectation is that the economic situation in Cuba will continue to improve. They are heavily dependent now on 
financial support from Venezuela. And as you know, President Chavez in Venezuela has announced that he has very advanced cancer. He's been treated twice in Cuba and more recently back in Caracas in Venezuela. So that major economic aid that's been going to Cuba from Venezuela is in danger. But if that can be resolved by the two countries, then I believe that the new economic freedoms announced by Raul Castro may help the uh, Cuban economic uh, system. As you know, Cuba has a superb health program. In fact, their life expectancy is higher than that in the United States, and their infant mortality rate is lower than ours. They have practically zero AIDS. So they have some things that they've done well, but what is still lacking, and what I speak about publicly, including the last time I was in Cuba, is the right of the Cuban people to elect their own leaders in a free and open and fair election. So political freedom is still absent from Cuba. An incremental improvement in economic freedoms might help the country. Given that China has achieved such spectacular good results in growing its economy, do you believe that China can and will have similar results in broadening its democracy? That's the arena in which the Carter Center has been involved uh, for more than a dozen years. As you may know, uh, in the beginning of 1979, uh, Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping and I announced diplomatic relations between our two countries. And, and that's exactly the same time we announced it on 15th of December. On the 18th of December, he announced openness and reform in China, a new system of economic and social life in China. And it's out of that that China has made such great progress. Uh, before that took place, there was no religious freedom in China. There was no freedom of movement of the people in China. There was, it was illegal to earn any sort of money for your own self in any kind of industry or business. And so we've seen the great transformation in economic development in China and, and other things as well. So I would guess that uh, at this point, they are on the verge of changing their leadership. Uh, there'll be new leaders coming into power in China in 2012. And uh, Rose and I have met, and so has Dr. Hardman, with a, with a new prospective president in China twice. He seems to be very uh, friendly and outgoing. But the fact is that similar to what's happening in the United States, the Chinese political system has gotten extremely conservative. So where there was a good bit of freedom of local elections and that sort of thing, which the Carter Center has monitored now for 12 years, now there's a general tightening up of political freedoms. And one of the problems that the Carter Center has, for instance, is we have a, a major website in China, both in Chinese and also in English. It's perhaps one of the most widely uh, used websites in China, analyzing what's going on dealing with political freedom. We don't take a, a stance one way or the other. We just report what's going on. And, and the Chinese government has been putting some pretty tight restraints on us recently. So nowadays, to summarize, it, it's tightening up. I think in the long run, though, it's almost inevitable that China will have to see some liberalization, some increased political freedom to follow up their enormously successful uh, economic freedom. During your presidency, you were a supporter of nuclear power, power even after the events of Three Mile Island. Given that the U.S. has once, to, once again broken ground on new reactors, have your views on this topic changed? No, I, I still believe very strongly that uh, nuclear power is one of the prospects for the future, uh, if it can be done safely, and I believe it can. As a matter of fact, the Three Mile Island incident took place while I was in the White House. And there were very dire predictions, particularly in the Washington Post, that hundreds of thousands of people would be uh, affected adversely and many thousands would die. I knew this was not the case because I was a nuclear engineer. I was familiar with the situation there and I had briefings from experts. So that Sunday, Rose and I went to the Three Mile Island nuclear reactor. We went into, inside the reactor control room and demonstrated that there was no danger there. Obviously, though, if there is a laxity of safety precautions, 
an inadequate design as I was in Japan, not anticipating the, the surge of water that covered them up, uh, then it's dangerous. But in general, I still approve the use of nuclear power. We have two nuclear power plants, as you know, being built now in Georgia to supplement those that are already operating here. Some of the states in our country right now, like Illinois, get about half their total electricity from nuclear power. And unless we develop some more uh, acceptable uh, approach to global warming than we have now, uh, then I think nuclear power will be one of the things that will be used in the future with increased use of natural gas and other things. So I'm a nuclear engineer. I think I know what I'm talking about. It has to be safe and carefully controlled, but nuclear power has a place in the future. Being a contributor to the Carter Center for 10 years now, I feel like family. In light of the Arab Spring, will the Carter Center devote more of its resources and talent to the challenges of that region, and particularly uh, Egypt and Libya? Well, I have to say the Carter Center doesn't have any role to play in Libya. Uh, I never was willing to have diplomatic relations with Libya while Gaddafi was in office, which I, as I was as well. As you know, he's, he was in power uh, for 34 years, I believe it was. So we, don't, we won't get involved in Libya unless, unless the Libyan people decide, which I hope they will, to have uh, a democratic election to choose a new government, in which case the Carter Center would be in the forefront of offering our services to help monitor uh, the election. My hope and expectation is, as long as I'm alive, is to have the hope, the, the prayer, that we can find peace for Israel and its neighbors. It will always be my top international priority. And my hope and expectation is that the Carter Center will play a major role, which will have to be flexible, of course, to accommodate the changes that are taking place that we can anticipate uh, in the Arab world particularly following the so-called Arab Spring. If, if, as I answered earlier, if, if, a, if an opportunity developed to help in Syria, we would do so without interfering otherwise than a, than a guarantee freedom and democracy. Uh, if Egypt will let us come in, we'll be there. We'll be there anyway in a small way. We'll be in Tunisia, as I said, next month, and we'll be glad to help in other way. We, we, we don't have any close relationship with our own government, which, as you know, will not deal with the Palestinian issue and has basically withdrawn from any role in bringing peace to the Mideast. But even if our own government does not do so, the Carter Center will make a major effort to bring peace to the Middle East. Yes. Knowing all of the things that the two of you have done in your life, is there anything left for you and Rosalind to accomplish? <laughs> um, we got a free airplane trip. Uh, we complained about some plane, an airplane once, and they told us they, they, that they've given us um, a free flight anywhere we want to go in the world, and we've never been in the Fiji Islands. <laughs> so I don't know wait, whether wait. we're me. I don't know whether we'll take them up on that or not. We were returning from China, and, and uh, Rosen's seat wouldn't go back and forth on a Delta plane, and my overhead light wouldn't come off and on. <laughs> so when I got back, I told the, I wrote a personal little handwritten note <laughs> to the president of, uh, of Delta and told him about it. I said, I'm not complaining, but I know that you want to make your future customers as happy as we've been for the last 30 years on Delta. So he wrote me a nice letter back and said, uh, I know you didn't complain for yourself, but you got a free trip anywhere in the world. So that's one of the things we might. But, but I'll have to get permission from John Harbin to take off. He's let me off a couple of months now to get my knees back in shape. But we have a lot of places we'd like to visit. And of course, one of the things we are going to continue to do is to raising our, our rapidly expanding family. We have four children, 12 grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. And so we've got a long way to go in. in uh, consummating that reproductive effort that we're making for the world <laughs> population. Well, I think we need to look at the schedule to get that. Uh... <laughs> President Carter, uh, tell us about the time you first realized you were in love with Mrs. Carter. Oh, 
Well, <laughs> our, our personal friends probably know this, so I'll be very brief. I was a midshipman at the Naval Academy, and uh, I was home on Christmas leave, and I was getting ready to be the first, uh, first classman, a senior. And I had known Rosalind since she was uh, one year old, at which time I lived in the next door house to her, and I was four years old. So I used to peep through the cradle at Rosalind lying there, I presume. I'm sure you remember that. And then when I was four years old, my family moved out of Plains to the so-called boyhood home out in the country. And I basically knew Rosalind as a friend of my youngest sister. But I never had a dream of dating Rosalind because I was much older than she was. <laughs> but um, on my last, on my, next to the last night of my uh, vacation from the Naval Academy, I was, I was dating Miss Georgia Southwestern College, the prettiest girl within 30 miles of Plains. <laughs> my Naval Academy uniform really paid off for me. <laughs> but her family had a family reunion, and she couldn't go out with me. So I was cruising around with my sister and her boyfriend looking for a date, and Rosen was in front of the Methodist Church on Sunday night, and I asked Rosen for a, a blind date, and she said, okay, she went with me. And so, I won't describe the evening, but the next morning, uh, when I got up, we went into the kitchen, my mother was cooking breakfast. She said, what did you do last night? I know Annelle had a family reunion. And I said, I went to a movie. She said, did you go with anybody? I said, yes. She said, who was it? I said, Rosen Smith. She said, what did you think of Rosen? And I said, she's the one I'm going to marry. <laughs> so. He didn't so, tell me that. So. <laughs> so the next uh, February, Rosen came to the Naval Academy to visit with me on Lincoln Washington's birthday, and I asked her to marry me, and she said no. <laughs> so from February to May, Rosen dated every available boy in Santa <laughs> County. There weren't many left uh, in those days. There were two. And finally, my... <laughs> <laughs> and finally, my uniform paid off, and she said yes. So we were married more than 65 years ago, and we've you know, grown to love and know each other more every day, I would say. I was very young, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, this was during the war. And I was going to George Southwestern College, and all of the, the only two young men in college um, were 4F who, could, who didn't qualify to go to war. <laughs> so I was going with everybody. I was going with all of these men, and I didn't go with any of them. <laughs> So you see, I was, I was a better choice than two other people. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Carter, are you pleased or discouraged by the degree to which Americans and citizens of other countries are understanding depression and other mental health disorders? If that's true, I would be very pleased. Uh, but I think I'm not, I'm not sure it's, it's true that other people are, uh, uh, know what depression is and are understanding it. So many countries don't have any kind of mental health system, and the Liberian was uh, one psychiatrist in that whole country, and no psychiatric nurses. The psychiatric nurses that we've trained have to be nurses to start with. Um, and then we put them through the training six months of intent six months, I think, mm -hmm. of intensive study. But I, I long for the day when people understand that mental illnesses, um, I started to say like other illnesses, but we've learned from uh, polling that um, depression, the, the stigma against depression is, and um, anxiety disorders is going down a little bit. But the polls show that um, the um, uh, stigma against schizophrenia, particularly, and the severe mental illnesses, um, is even getting worse. In this country? 
in this country, in our country. And not much, but it's getting a little bit worse. Uh, and um, this was a, a study done by Columbia University and Indiana University, I think. And it's not totally getting worse, but it is in some places. And I think that because um, people are learning and they're learning, we te we are telling them that it's like any other illness, and it's that your brain, a disorder of the brain, and then they, they're afraid of a brain disorder. They're afraid. So we're trying to decide on how to pitch stigma, and the journalists educating people and writing balanced uh, um, reports is very helpful in that. But I, I long for the day when everybody accepts mental illness as a disease like any other disease, and when people go, I, and I think when I think that um, when somebody with a mental illness goes to the doctor, almost always they leave, and they are diagnosed. They almost always leave without any hope for a better life. And I believe that that is changing a little bit. I think they've always been told, that, you know, you're going to have to live with this, and and um, maybe you can control it with some medication or something, but. Um, but I think that's beginning to change a little bit because um, now we know that recovery is possible. And so mental health treatment is beginning to be, instead of just controlling, to, to moving um, toward the strengths that people have and giving people with mental illness a hope that they can have a better future. And uh, we're working now for, um, toward more community centers and integrated care, where everybody goes for any kind of illness, physical, mental, any kind of illness. And I think that will do as much to overcome stigma as anything, because I, I think if people in the community see everybody going, uh, people with mental illness, l raising families, going to work every day, and going to the doctor just when they need help, they'll get to know the people and know that it's not, won't, won't have that fear factor so much which I think is, is what holds back the uh, lifting of stigma. I think it's the greatest barrier. But um, uh, so, I would be delighted. Sure. I think the, the fact is that Europe, the Western European countries are probably ahead of us. I would think that we and the Canadians would come next. The Japanese that are fairly affluent have not made much progress on mental uh, health. And the Chinese uh, are beginning to get interested in it more. But the third world countries in which the Carter Center works mostly, they have practically no concept of uh, successful treatment of mental illness. So I'd say the world is very backward uh, on mental health for the vast majority of the population of Earth. Childhood obesity is a major health challenge in the United States. What have you seen to be the situation in the rest of the world? Not as bad. Primarily because people don't have food to eat. Uh, if you go to, say, North Korea, uh, I was there not too many months ago, uh, <laughs> you, you wouldn't see a fat person in, in North Korea, except maybe the leader of North Korea. I'm not sure about him. He's a little bit plump. But, uh, but people walking down the street are like they used to be in Plains, Georgia, in the 1930s. You know, where the overalls were very loose and you couldn't even see where the tummy was. But, but nowadays, of course, in Plains, Georgia, and, and everywhere else in this country, obesity is getting, uh, becoming a crisis. And, and there's a special program this, this last night on television about the rapid increase of diabetes in the world. It's now become one of the most prevalent killers of people uh, on Earth, primarily because of, uh, of obesity. So this is mainly in the rich world where people have excess of food to eat and where they eat the wrong kinds of food. And I think this is something that uh, is going to have to be addressed uh, maybe by just a, a concentration of, uh, of health education as we experienced back in the late 70s uh, concerning the smoking of uh, cigarettes. Uh, this question is to Rosalind. Was it true that President Carter wanted the thermostat set at 68 degrees in the White House during the energy crisis in the 70s? I was in the sixth grade at the time, living in New York City, 
and was very concerned you were not warm enough in that big old house. You were right. <laughs> and I think it was 65 instead of 60. <laughs> and I used to, when we first got to the White House, I would go um, out the back door. My office was in the East Wing on the other side of the White House from West Wing where Jimmy was. Go in the door, go upstairs to my office. And when we left home, it was nine degrees in Plains. It was cold, and it was a cold winter. And I did that for about two weeks, and then one day I was on the elevator, and the, and the usher said, Miss Carter, why don't you just go downstairs and go through over to the other building? And I said, show me how. So he took me down, we went down, all kind of things down there, paint shops and electrical shops and bomb shelter, and everything. And he took me down. And it had these big um, pipes, steam pipes. It was so warm. It <laughs> <laughs> was the only time I got warm, I think. And, I, I, and I'll tell you one other funny thing. There was a maid at the White House that felt sorry for me. And um, she brought me some underwear, little drawers that I could wear that to come down. Rose, Rose. <laughs> like like Rose, long johns, except they weren't long. <laughs> You did not cold. get too personal in it. <laughs> uh, President Carter, tell us about your role with the elders and how your work with the Carter Center has influenced them. Uh, now, almost four years ago, Nelson Mandela and his wife and, uh, and some others formed what was called the elders. And they decided that they would take, uh, you might say, political has-beens, uh, people who have played prominent roles in, in the world and bring them together uh, in order to cooperate on different issues. So now uh, I'm one of them, the president of, uh, former president of, uh, of Brazil is one, the former president of uh, Ireland is one, the former prime minister of uh, Norway is one, the former president of Finland is one, the former secretary general of the United Nations is one, uh, and so forth. And so there are 10 of us now, Nelson Mandela is no longer active, and we meet a couple of times a year and we address major issues that we believe that incumbent politicians are not willing to address. And uh, I would say that on the Middle East situation, for instance, the nine other elders agree with me 100% on the same approach to the Middle East, the same concern about Palestinian rights as the Carter Center does. So uh, it's a very uh, loose-knit organization. One of the things they promised us was we never would have to raise money. So we have a group of sponsors or advisors or counselors. They provide all the money for the elders. And we have a very a wonderful and fairly rapidly growing staff located in London. So we address uh, issues of that, of that kind. And, and they, uh, when I, for instance, the last time I went to North Korea, the elders went with me. This is something that a lot of uh, incumbent politicians would not do is go to North Korea. So I think you can see a, a, a big advantage to it. We're still exploring different ways for us to serve. And I've been very gratified at how closely uh, they, the elder, other elders have worked with me uh, and uh, in, in compatibility with the Carter Center. What advice do you have for President o Obama on how to deal with the congressional issues related to the economy? Well, he's afflicted with a way that I wasn't. When I was uh, president, I had very wonderful working relationship with both Democrats and Republicans. And we had a, a better batting average with the Congress than any other president since, uh, since the Second World War, except Lyndon Johnson was a little bit better than I did, I was. So, but I, I worked very closely with the moderate and, uh, and conservative Democrats, some of the liberals. I worked very closely with the Republicans as well. The only people that I had trouble with, really, was the very liberal Democrats who the last couple of years were supporting uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, who wanted to run for president against me. So I had a good working relationship with him. I, I think that now, though, he's faced with a very difficult problem which, with which all of you are familiar. 
Uh, there's one major difference between him and me as far as governing is concerned. When, when I had a major task to uh, face as a president uh, with energy or with education, a new education department or things of that kind, the environment, I drafted all the legislation in the White House with a very wonderful staff headed by Stu Eisenstadt, a former lawyer from, from uh, Atlanta. And, uh, and we would bring in the top leaders in the Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, of that particular committee, said the Education Committee, to work with us on writing the legislation that would set up a new Department of Education, which didn't exist then. And so by the time we presented the uh, legislation to the Congress, the, the key leaders in the committees were already familiar with it and were basically supportive. Obviously, the Congress changed the things that we proposed. They always did. If they, if they changed it too much, then I would either threaten to veto it or actually veto the bills. And the other thing is that, that I would, uh, was very deeply involved in the actual drafting of the legislation, and I could take what I proposed to the public on television and speaking around the country and try to get the public to back me and overcome the opposition that developed in the Congress. This is not something that, uh, that President Obama has ever done until last week. When he got ready, for instance, for a health program, he said, we'll let the Congress draft it, see what comes out, and then we'll work on it. So five different committees worked on the health program, and it come, turned out to be the lowest common denominator of all of them. It's still very unpopular in the country, as you know. Finally, last week, he came up with a program to put people back to work, and now he's out on the hustings, going to different places every day to sell his program. I think that's the right way to approach the presidency is to use the major uh, the, the di dynamic pulpit of the White House, but also to take your pro 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 proposal directly to the people and try to convince them that it's the right thing and let them convince the Republican or Democratic Congress members who are recalcitrant. So that's the only advice I would give, and I think he's already t done that on his own initiative, not because of me, is to be involved in the drafting of a program, take it directly to the public, and try to override opposition in the veto by let, convincing the American people that his proposal is better than what this Congress is proposing. After 65 years of marriage, what advice could you give young couples to sustain a commitment made with great sincerity? And Mrs. Carter, how have you carved out your own path over the years while still maintaining this strong marriage? Well, I think the best way to keep a marriage together is to give your partner space and for him to give, for Jim, me to give Jimmy space and him to give me space. Um, we learned that late in our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but we never had thought about it before until we came home from the White House and it's the first time we'd ever been home together all day, every day. <laughs> and um, and it, was, it was difficult at first, but we learned and, and it works. Um, I do my things, he does his things, we do our things together, and, um, and it's good. And another thing that we, d we do is we've been kind of isolated at, at times, like when Jim was governor, when he was president. You don't have friends that call on you. Well, you have some, and you have a good time with your close friends. But uh, lots of times we are together with something to, looking for something to do. And we started, well, Jimmy taught me to, um, play tennis. He was a tennis player. He was a champion tennis player in high school. Never beat his father. <laughs> but, um, and we, we do things, the things we do, we do together, like fly fish and bird watching and, and um, bike, riding bikes and riding the trike and those things that we do together. And I think that's, I, 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 we just have a good relationship together. Mm -hmm. I would say in addition to giving each other space, uh, we try to resolve our differences before we go to sleep at night. That's, <laughs> as Rosa said, it doesn't always work. But um, for a long time in our marriage, we would carry on, carry over an argument for several days, uh, even longer sometimes. But uh, I, I think making that commitment to try to at least communicate with each other and give each other plenty of space to develop your own independent life sharing what you have in common, uh, those are pretty th three simple but very important rules. Right. 
As a returned Peace Corps volunteer, I'm concerned about the future of the Peace Corps. What do you think of, the, of its future? I think the Peace Corps has a good future. Uh, I've been working very closely, for instance, with key members of the Congress, even in the last few months and weeks, writing letters to try to, to sustain budgeting uh, funds for the Peace Corps. And uh, I believe that there's such a great need and so many supporters of the Peace Corps, including past, past Peace Corps volunteers, and I believe that the Peace Corps has a very good future. So I, this is one of the areas of, of, of life that has been developed in our country that I believe is so good that it has a life of its own almost and has bipartisan support. So my outlook on the Peace Corps is very uh, positive. How did you mark the 10th anniversary of September 11th? Well, we stayed at home church. and we went to church. Uh, our church is a very close-knit, small congregation. We um, prayed for the families of those who suffered and prayed that our country would uh, respond to 9-11 to, to in, in a, as peaceful as possible a way and also to preserve civil rights and human rights uh, and not overreact in a negative or warlike way. Uh, so we just observed it quietly, but with sadness of the loss and uh, hope that our country will build on the tragedy of 9-11 to become once again the most admired and revered country on earth because of its commitment to the basic things that have always made us strong, that is peace, justice, I would say freedom, democracy, and the alleviation of suffering for others. Those are the things that made our country great, and that's our prayer after 9-11. You mentioned the elections in Nicaragua. Could you speak to your history with Daniel Ortega? <laughs> well, one of the first uh, elections we ever monitored was when uh, the Sandinistas were in a war that was orchestrated by President Reagan. You remember the Iran-Contra scandals and that sort of thing. The Contras were the military forces that were being financed uh, by the U.S. government to overthrow the Sandinistas. And so the Carter Center were invited in by all the sides in an election to monitor the outcome and make sure it was fair and honest. And it was. And the Sandinistas, who were looked upon as the major favorites, lost the election. And they were so overconfident that they were not willing to accept the outcome of the election. So I met with all the Sandinista junta, there were nine of them, leaders of the, of the Sandinistas, in the middle of the night, and I finally induced Daniel Ortega to accept the results. And I took him to see his major opponent, and, uh, and they embraced and, and agreed to accept the results of the election. So two more times in the future, we were invited to monitor the elections in Nicaragua, uh, Daniel Ortega lost both times, and the last election they had that we monitored, he finally won. And I would say that uh, basically the election was fair and honest. Uh, they are facing another election pretty soon, and I was hoping that we could go down there and monitor again, but we've had some difficulty in getting the uh, Nicaraguan government to give us unlimited access to all the aspects of the uh, election process. At the last moment, they've come forward some, with some pretty good promises, but it may be too late for us to get involved. So we'll be there in some form and uh, still dealing with a very uh, unique and difficult, partially successful, shrewd character named Daniel Ortega. <laughs> and uh, I've known him thoroughly enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> What is your opinion about the possible outcome of the recent efforts and request of the Palestinians for statehood? Well, we support this move very strongly. My hope is that the uh, United Nations will recognize the statehood of, of Palestine. It's the same avenue that Israelis took leading up to 1948 when Israel was accepted by the United Nations as as a political entity that should be recognized. 
And uh, the inevitability is that, that the United States will veto this effort in the United Nations Security Council. But the Palestinians now plan to take their effort both to the Security Council, probably, but certainly to the General Assembly, where all the members of the uh, United Nations have a chance to vote. And my guess is that the Senate, that the uh, uh, Palestinians will get uh, 140 to 150 nations who would vote for their becoming a state. This will not change the occupation of Palestine by the Israelis. And it will just make the, if, if the UN, United States does veto in the Security Council, then they will not become a fully recognized member of the United Nations, but they will become a, 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 an officially recognized observer uh, if the General Assembly votes. And this will give them certain access to membership uh, in international organizations and build a step forward. I would not be in favor of this if the United States had put forward any sort of comprehensive peace proposal, as President uh, Obama has announced on two major occasions. One, a freeze on all Israeli settlements inside, Pakistan, uh, inside Palestine, and also based on the 1967 borders. If the United States would put forward that proposal as a basis for negotiation, then both the Palestinians and the Carter Center would be in favor of peace talks based on those two issues. But the Israelis are not willing to accept those proposals, and President Obama is not willing to make that, that effort. So as an alternative to a deadlock and a stalemate now, uh, we reluctantly would support the Palestinian move for recognition, at least in the General Assembly. And now one final question. What can you and the Carter Center do to help educate the members of Congress on working in developing countries with, a, with respect for the individuals rather than going in with a heavy hand? Practically nothing. I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that Congress uh, is receptive of any advice from, from the Carter Center. But, but I still maintain a very close relationship to key members of the Congress. I was talking yesterday to one of the House members who has been uh, trying to negotiate the release of, uh, of a corporal uh, that's, that Shalit, that's being held by the, by the Hamas. We've given, been working with him in that effort. And uh, this past week, I was also talking to Senator John Kerry, who's the chairman of the, of the Foreign Relations Committee. So I maintain a, a contact with key members of the House and Senate. They contact me on occasion to find out what the Carter Center is doing in different countries. And, and, we, and we maintain a, a very close uh, effort to inform the members of the Congress when we do something that we believe is important that relates to foreign assistance or the work of the, uh, of the State Department or sometimes even the Defense Department. For instance, uh, when I returned from North Korea on, on my last trip with a few other elders, uh, I brought back an offer from a four-star general who's in charge of the military forces in North Korea and he invited the United States to come over there and they would, with full cooperation from the North Koreans, to search for the remains of uh, U.S. military people who died and were buried in North Korea. So when we have uh, something like that to bring back, then we have that kind of contact either with the administration or the White House or the Congress. But I would say those are of minor, uh, of minor Im importance in shaping the policies or the attitude uh, in Washington. And of course, uh, I write uh, op uh, editorials in the newspapers, which I'm sure some of them read. I, I had an editorial published today in an International Herald Tribune dealing with a question that we just got about the reason for uh, our support of the Palestinian move in the United Nations. And calling on, uh, after this takes place, calling on the international community, that is, the uh, International Quartet, where the United States is a leader, and the United Nations and the European U Union and Russia are involved, then to put forward a proposal based on uh, the withdrawal of Israel from the occupied territories based on the 67 borders. So 
that, that's an editorial that I wrote that just happens to be published today in the international newspaper. So we do what we can, but I, I, to answer your question, I think that I, the impact of our voice in the Congress is very minimal. But Jimmy, um, Jennifer goes to, to the Congress and briefs the yes. people. Jennifer does and Karen does, and so our people are working with the various committees. Um, and, and a lot of them um, um, ask for our people to come because they know that we know a lot about different areas in the world. So we, we do a lot of that. And, and with the State Department. And with the State, and with the State Department. Department. Mm -hmm. Well, if you would please remain at your seats while the Carters leave for another announcement, but uh, please join me in thanking President and Mrs. Carter for a wonderful evening. I want to thank you for being here tonight, but I also want to thank you for your support. It is so important to us. We need your help. We have a lot of volunteers that come and help us. We need volunteers, but we, we particularly need your support for the, our programs. Um, and we couldn't do what we do without you. And so we, we consider you all partners, and we, we're very grateful for your support. <laughs> Well, thank you for being part of this great evening with the Carters, and I will add my thanks to all of you for the continued support of the work that the Carter Center does. The next program in the conversation series will be the State of Democracy in the Americas, and that will be Tuesday, October 13th. According to the Inter-American Democratic Charter, the peoples of the Americas have the right to democracy in their governments, have an obligation to promote and defend it. And this is the 10th anniversary of this important document, and a panel will discuss the state of democracy in the Americas. So we look forward to seeing you on October 13th. This will be a free event, and you can register online at cartercenter.org slash conversations on Friday, September 16th. Also, while you're here, be sure to visit the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum to see the new exhibit, Read My Pens, the Madeleine Albright Collection. And th that will be here until November 27th. The collection features more than 200 pens, many of which Secretary Albright wore to communicate messages during her diplomatic trips and their maps indicating where she went and also information on the issues that she discussed. So I think you will really enjoy that exhibit. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you in October. Good night. <laughs>